Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jamie uh, Blackburn. I'm one of the uh, ETNZ Executive Committee members and it is my pleasure to be um, joined by Michael Braithwaite today from the UK. Um, kia ora Michael, how are you? Kia ora Jamie, I'm well thank you. How are you? Very good, thank you. Very good. I will uh, just start with a little bit of housekeeping. I know if you've been listening to a few of the other um, seminars and interviews today. You will have heard a bit of this before, but I'll run through it if you've just joined us for this one. Um, just so everyone knows, uh, if you want to attend, uh, attend the ETNZ AGM, it is on this afternoon at 5.30 through uh, one of these links. Um, remember our lobby space is open, which is a separate space that uh, anyone can join outside of sessions and uh, take part in any kind of casual conversation and catch up with anyone else who's in there. Um, Make sure I've got everything. Obviously, if you've got your trade show passport, uh, you can still uh, access a, a lot of the deals from all our normal trade show uh, suppliers who weren't able to set up this time because of our online version. But all of those links and all of those uh, deals are available with your trade show passport. Um, very good. Uh, so I'm just going to run through a little quick intro for you, Michael, and then we're just going to get into it. Um, Michael Braithwaite um, uh, was born in New Zealand, um, grew up moving around uh, all over New Zealand and uh, in Rangatonga, if I've got that right. Um, That's right, yeah. Uh, was a, um, a filmmaker and a theatre maker from a very young age. Um, uh, uh, grew up in his uh, later teens uh, down in the South Island, um, making a, a myriad of shows in the amateur dramatic so um, societies down there. Uh, was fortunate enough to uh, get a scholarship uh, in New York um, to uh, where he was one of the youngest uh, attendees of, uh, as a producer and director. Uh, joined the Jim Henson uh, company uh, from there and expanded a very, um, a very extensive international career as a producer and theatre director and director of uh, live performance in kind of every field and range that uh, that it could be. So uh, we're very fortunate enough to have uh, Michael joining us uh, today. Uh, he's currently based in the UK and he's just taken on the new role as the director for the uh, Edinburgh Military Tattoo. Uh, and we're very excited to have him representing us um, around the world. Kia ora, Michael, how are you? I'm well, thanks, Jamie. Yeah, thanks very much. Very good. Um, do you want to, uh, I hope I stumbled through that intro okay. Oh, that, that, <laughs> that, 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 that's kind of how I stumbled through it too, uh, back in the day, Jamie. So yeah, that, that sort of roughly covers it, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Michael, I guess one of the reasons um, we've asked you to come and talk to us today is uh, are you good. looking for a better multi-channel intercom system yeah. wired and, and wireless yeah, right. do you Excuse want to get rid of the moment. heavy complicated and expensive matrix um, let's Michael, discover the green go really communication system to, uh, up to 3,000 users and 250 groups that, uh, can be right. connected sorry, to sorry, the Jamie, uh, within the ethernet network why uh, green go around go? the world uh, to do stuff and it's always often a big ambition of ours to be able to do it and you're someone who's fortunate enough to, to be able to uh, travel so um, tell us a little bit more about how you managed to launch your career uh, and how that works alongside the kind of production sector yeah uh, well in, in terms of launching it um it was sort of what I'd call old school of just um, diving in and, uh, and learning on the job. Um, so when I first sort of started into uh, production, I was, um, just started university and uh, took on a role as one of three production managers for Christchurch's Summertime Festival, which um, <clears throat> was a big sense of um, program of free outdoor um, performances, um, shows and spectaculars that um, took place in Christchurch every summer. And some, some, of, those, um, some of those events still, still carry on to this day uh, in different guises. So um, <clears throat> it sort of, sort of predated much being available in the way of formal training or anything. Um, so it was um, 
you know, pretty much the old school way of doing things of just rolling up your sleeves and learning um, from people who knew more and, um, and, through, and through experience. And, um, and then the rest of it, um, again, the old adage of just hammering away on doors for opportunities until doors opened. Very good. It's a, um, it must be hard to kind of make a name where, uh, coming from a small country. Do you find that um, New Zealanders have quite a good reputation and brand internationally from our kind of input into live performance? Yeah, there were a couple of things when I started. Um, and it feels funny talking about when I started because I feel like I still feel like I'm starting in a way because it's just a constant voyage of learning and discovery. Um, so it's, it's very odd <laughs> speaking as a, um, with experience. But um, the, the New Zealand thing, I think, for me, worked pretty well. Um, what, one of the things I, I cottoned on to pretty quickly when I was sort of initially uh, hammering away at people's um, uh, doors overseas was being in New Zealand a major bit of a novelty. So they tended to um, be more likely to get a reply just by the um, simple virtue of the fact that you're possibly the first New Zealander anyone had heard from. Um, so, so there was a degree of curiosity. Um, and on top of that, I think our international rep was strong even, even when I was um, getting going. Uh, our, 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 particularly our technical and um, you know, production people are, are really well regarded overseas. So I think I was sort of, you know, uh, had that legacy to feed on as well, that, um, that, that Kiwi, Kiwi practitioners are, are pretty well regarded on the international stage and that, that helps as well. So, you know, that you, you can make it work for you just by, you know, virtue of being, um, being a small country, you can stand out a little more. Yeah, I guess there's um, across all disciplines as well, we've got a pretty good rap um, through, through directing performance as well as our production mm. support and uh, yeah. like design, set design and the likes. I guess you've had a career that spanned from, from, your, from your early days uh, down in Christchurch production managing um, like the, the outdoor symphony orchestra stuff, uh, right through to directing and producing. Do you have a preference of what um, area you like to work in, or do you feel like they're all quite interchangeable throughout your career? Uh, it usually depends on what kind of day I'm having. If I'm having a good day, it's a great one. If it's a bad day, I wish I was doing the other thing. Um, I, uh, at the moment, I think I'm probably uh, enjoying the creative direction work more, which is what I've been doing more of in the last last few years. Um, they, they both have their value and, and, you know, again, as Kiwis, I think we have to be pretty multifaceted. Um, it's pretty hard to specialize in one thing in New Zealand uh, exclusively, you know, being able to turn your hand to more than one thing keeps you, keeps you in work. Uh, so I think, I think most, most Kiwi practitioners you'd look at, you would say we can, you know, can do one of several, if not many jobs in the industry what can catch you out when you go to a bigger market like London is everyone there is a specialist and um, going in as a Kiwi generalist, um, people can't, aren't always sure where to place you. So one of the things you can do with that is if you're, if you're going after a particular opportunity is again, just that old trick of um, making sure your CV is written to the job you're going for. Um, which you know can sometimes mean if, if it's it's a certain role highlighting all that stuff in your previous career because um, they get a little confused if you say you, you do lots of things yeah of course of course it is and do you find that um, you you find it easier to jump between those kind of different disciplines quite regularly or do you find that you prefer mm. to kind of go yeah, from you're kind of doing a section you're doing a doing a bit of both when when you um, doing a lot of events anyway I you know even in this current role which is um, creative director but I'm still very involved in the production and uh, production management of things simply partly because you know I'm structuring uh, a team helping structure a team to deliver on on the work I'm doing as a creative director and sometimes that means you know molding a new production team or bringing in additional people if you're going in a different direction because this is a slightly different kind of contract for me in that I'm taking on something that's already an existing entity rather than starting, you know, from the ground up. So I'm sort of inheriting a, a, a tradition and a system and a way of doing things. And then on top of that, um, shaping it slightly to the way we're going to take the show in the future. So having that production background uh, is really helpful. And I, I certainly think um, 
getting a wide range of experience in, in different fields is really helpful as, as you um, grow into your career. Great. It's the, um, it definitely is a, a kind of a bit of a moving feast and it definitely depends on the work that you're doing. Mm. Uh, do you feel that, do you go out and pick work that you'd like to do or, or do you normally find that the work picks yourself? Uh, you've obviously worked uh, around the world. You've worked in, in Asia and the Middle East. Um, so kind of, uh, and London and the States. So it's a real breadth of uh, different cultures and different approaches to making work. Yeah, uh, yeah. What, what do you find normally um, <coughs> lends itself to your kind of way of, of creating? Well, yeah, the, the first thing is, I'm sure you know, is there's no such thing as normal in our business um, anyway. Um, a, a, again, it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's been both. Um, I've had um, some projects I've gone after, uh, I've seen the opportunity and, and made contact and others have um, come to me. So the, the current one that, that, was, um, that, that came to me just as New Zealand was going into lockdown um, started last year. And um, yeah, we, I think we're about two days out from full lockdown. And of course, watching the whole industry just um, burst into flames and then uh, quite unexpectedly got an approach um, about the Edinburgh tattoo from a headhunter in London uh, at a time where I really wasn't expecting to be seeing or hearing of anything for quite some time. So, you know, it can go both ways. And have you had um, much other experience up in Edinburgh and around the festival and around the tattoo before? Yeah, I have actually. I used to live in Edinburgh. I lived there for five years. Um, and it was a time where uh, I was, um, it was about 10 years ago. And I was, uh, at the time, I was producing an event called Music Works for um, Scottish Enterprise and the Scottish music industry, which was basically a Scottish version of South by Southwest for contemporary music. So, uh, trade show convention much like you're doing and then um with this conference and then um we took over about 30 live music venues in glasgow for a week um so we had bands from all around the uk and artists from all over the world performing so yeah so i, I kind of knew uh scotland and edinburgh already which i'm sure didn't hurt uh, when it came to uh, taking on the tattoo very good it's a, um it's certainly a different kind of world in Edinburgh especially when the festival over there it's yeah. I almost say the festival's like the the uh, Olympics of the arts and the, the tattoos kind of the the 100 meter sprint final um when you when you position that in a, on a global scale what do you think separates out the, the that size of scale of work um internationally and what makes it kind of uniquely special mm, yeah it's a good question the, you know, because the thing is <clears throat> with the tattoo, it's only one of, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. It's only one of a number of military tattoos around the world, but um, with it, without question, it's the most iconic one. Uh, and it's an iconic world spectacular in its own right. Um, a big part of that is location. Um, Edinburgh Castle is an absolutely iconic venue and it's uniquely set up almost for castles to have a huge performance space in front of it which is where the tattoo takes place and the castle esplanade um, now that that comes with a number of challenges um, the, the biggest one of course putting in um, very uh, elaborate and expensive and extensive um, stands and seating uh, for the show but then you've got 8,800 people um, hanging above Edinburgh um, with this, this stunning castle as a backdrop to the show. So, so that, that's a big part of it. Um, and the other aspect of it, I guess, is scale. Um, the, you know, the tattoo can feature up to you know, 1,000 or more live performers, which really puts it up there in terms of um, uh, viewing experiences. And then, of course, as you said, um, it's taking place in August while the Edinburgh Festival as a whole is taking place so you've got the fringe the international festival the film festival etc everything taking place and then of course this jewel in the crown every night with uh, with the lights music and fireworks coming off um off the castle in the central city so yeah in terms of getting attention uh you could do worse uh, in terms of a, a set of scenario, um, circumstances to do a show in is there is there any other performance or work around the world that you 
haven't had the chance to do that you would just love to do that you're buying it a bit to, to get a chance to get involved yeah oh there's 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 there's, there's any number of things um in terms of uh, large live spectaculars, I guess uh, Cirque du Soleil has an appeal. And I've had friends and colleagues who've been part of Cirque over the years, uh, including w one friend who I think is presenting at this conference as well. Um, so, so there's that. Um, I, I, um, I, I don't spend an awful lot of time these days sort of um, focusing on chasing the the next big thing probably because the current big thing is um, is chewing up a fair bit fair bit of the time and attention and and if there's if there's one thing i've learned that is is the next thing is almost never the thing you were expecting um this certainly wasn't because and until i came on board um the the tattoo has been run by a retired british general of some shape or form for the last 70 years and at least a general um so you know shattering a number of molds um uh, and taking this role on, so uh, out of out of this and what, what may or may not lead to next, uh, literally no idea. But I'm sure it'll be exciting. Yes, I think it's an interesting point that um, that for such a big event, it's always been it's always been directed, um, definitely artistically, but from from a military background because it's a military performance. So <laughs> for the first time, uh, as far as I'm aware, at least in, in the in the Edinburgh. Um, tattoos history that they've, they've gone outside of that um, world to, to pick an artistic director uh, who's come from from a theatrical and, and industry and performance background yeah do you think um well, why do you think that is and and we're obviously very excited that the first person to do that outside of that role is a, is a kiwi so yeah celebrate that much and we'll say that's the reason but also on top of that why else do you think that might be yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting, and you're right. Yeah, it's um, uh, prior prior to me coming on board, as you say, it's it's always you know been one one person who was running both the organisation and and the show, and the board of the tattoo uh, in this next iteration made the decision to split the role into two, which is now a CEO and a creative director, um, which is fundamentally you know that gone to an industry standard of a, of a producer and, and, a, and a director. So we've still got a general at the top who's now the new CEO, who's a retired Major General um, Buster Howes, who's uh, formerly commander of the British uh, Royal Marines. And, uh, and then <laughs> just after I came on board, we took on a new COO who's an American former Marine. So I've got a Marine on each shoulder, which is great when it comes, you know, to those tricky conversations, because you feel like you've got a bit more firepower than you might normally get. But what that did was split the role into more, you know, typically, uh, uh, you know, in industry practice. And I think it made a lot of sense. So you can, you know, the creative director can focus on the creative and uh, the CEO mm -hmm. focuses on running the company. So it means I can dedicate most of my time to the creative output, whereas the, the previous guys obviously had a lot more um, to deal with out, outside the show. So it may, means that the, sh the show can innovate. It can take an in industry practice and innovation, which is what the board were looking for when they um, made this appointment. It was just someone who could take the show to the next level. That's great. If I can... Um throw back to kind of one of your earlier um events when you were down london doing the uh it was the, is the opening of the olympics was it that you did the it, was, it wasn't the opening i um i was producing um the mayor of london's outdoor arts festival for the uh 2012 london olympics so that was uh funded by the mayor of london and the uh the remit was to occupy all um 33 london boroughs uh, with, uh, with outdoor uh, entertainment and arts uh, installations during the seven weeks of the Games and the Interval and the Paralympics. So I think we did something like 5,000 individual performances around London. And uh, as you imagine, dealing with 33 different councils uh, at, at the same time made it a, a, a fairly hefty exercise. And, and some, of those, um, some of those pieces, obviously the Central London stuff that that I'm familiar with because I've been fortunate to see some of the videos of it. It's it's very, um, to me, it looks like it's very technical driven as well. It's a lot of light shows, there's fireworks, there's lasers, there's 
uh, big soundscapes. Do you find that we, when we're outside of a, a kind of a theatrical style performance with a with a, a human performer led piece, are you mm. driven lots by the uh, the current the new technology, the equipment that's available, your technical team? Do you find that, or do, do people bring you options to um to try and explore? I know that those. Yeah kind of events often have the budgets to develop new equipment or use the latest technology, which is, I think, quite interesting to us. Yeah, I think, um, you know, and this might be a heartbreaker for people, but um, there's never enough money. It doesn't matter what show you're doing. Um, You know, regardless of how big your budget is, your original idea is always over. It's always over budget, whether you're Disney, Universal, Cirque du Soleil or whatever, I I think... um, uh, if your first idea is on budget, then you haven't been really trying hard enough. Um, it's my, my kind of view. Um, so, but that, that aside, what I always try to do is be led first by the story you're trying to tell and the emotional connection you're trying to make um, because it's all too easy to just throw tech at, uh, at a solution. And I don't think anything works since you've actually understood what it is you're trying to do and what story you're trying to tell or what you're trying to say. So I always try to get that figured out first and then um, decide what, uh, what um, paint brushes and colors I'm going to use, you know, because our, our tech is basically our easel and our, and our paint scheme. And, you know, so figure out your picture and then figure out what colors and brushes you want to use to tell it. Yes, I think it, it makes a lot of sense where, where, where the lead of that idea comes from. And I think it's always um, it's always exciting for the, the tech division as well of the, of the industry to, to be able to work alongside creators like yourself to try and develop uh, solutions to telling those stories and achieving mm-hmm. those ideas. Um, do, you have a, do you have a particular process that, that you approach um, or that you normally prefer to kind of lay down for for a job or are you often led by the process depending on the on the particular gig yeah again it's a little of both um you know again as i say i like to get clear as as early on as i can um what what the big picture story you know it's the elevator pitch if you can't if you can't tell someone in 30 seconds your story or write it down on half a page it's probably too complicated and um as as i've gone on um through different projects i think i've become more um tuned into keeping that initial simplicity in the idea because the more you add tech and the more you add budget, the more it will naturally complicate anyway as, as it develops. So if you start with a really complicated idea and then throw complicated solutions at it, you can soon collapse under the weight of your own ambitions. So I, I always try to start with something fundamentally simple in terms of a story because then it gives us that range to work within. And then um, it also creates a, 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 a you know, freedom for uh of expression for the other people involved so you know when you when you put a show together while you might be directing it you are also working with a number of other artists and i don't just mean the performers um i mean your lighting designers your sound designers your costumers and whatever they're all artists in collaboration with you so i I don't work in, in a notion of do this do that um there's a degree of this is what i want to achieve but then i really like to get that extra um, input from from the other artists and designers and you know every, everyone's an artist in their own way when we're, when we're doing this kind of work so you know even if it's just um, knowing where to place um, lamps or speakers or you know an elegant way of running cable or, or whatever it all adds to the picture in the story so you know everyone's an artist in collaboration absolutely um, that, that's fantastic and I think we, you can almost draw that back to kind of your process you create when you when you first start creating work do you uh do you draw a lot on your experiences in New Zealand and your and and the culture that we have here when you take your work internationally do you find that that gives it a very particular and unique flavor it's it's possible yeah I I think um I think when I was when I was starting out, I didn't appreciate it as much as I could have. But that's probably you know that's the nature of being younger. You never appreciate anything as much as you could have. But I as 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 I've gone um, 
further into this career and work, I've, I've become more and more aware, I think, and, and prouder and prouder of what New Zealand achieves and stands for on the international stage. You know, we do incredible work within the country. Uh, and, you know, and you don't need me to point that out. You know, our legacy of film, TV and theatre and music, um, visual arts, dance, you name it, um, in, incredibly strong, you know, and, you know, we do punch above our weight. Uh, but what I think is also brilliant is that we're creating fantastic work within the country and internationally. It's not like we're losing everybody overseas. And as soon as we've seen with the pandemic, um, you know, when, when, the, when the chips are down, our heart tends to be back in New Zealand. And, you know, you've seen this over the last couple of years, the number of people have been back on home shores that are often out and about in the world, you know, for most of the year. So, you know, it, it again speaks to the strength of what we do and also how, how New Zealanders are regarded internationally. You know, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty good um, passport to be holding in our industry. I think so. I think, I think a lot of people in our industry, are, in New Zealand, are, are so fortunate to be here right now. We're able mm. to put on uh, shows. Uh, obviously, this last weekend's been tough for for the whānau down in Wellington yeah. but um, over the if we look back over the last like 14 16 months however long it's been uh, we've, we've had a pretty incredible run and been pretty resilient and it has shown the desire for work but in saying that I think as soon as as soon as we're able to get out and travel and explore again there's going to be a lot of desire to do that um, yeah. if you had a if you had a piece of advice for anyone here who wanted to launch an international career in uh, in the arts and production or producing, uh, what would you, if you had to pick one thing or two, what would you say? I can pick two. Um, and okay. it was the advice that was given to me um, when I was starting, um, uh, particularly when I was doing a lot of theatre work. And, um, and this, this came from Cameron McIntosh, who was kind enough to reply to my um, letter when I was really young starting out and saying I was keen to get into the game and his advice to me which I think still stands is try and work in every department you can at least to get a taste of what's involved um, which means you don't have to be good at all of it but if you're uh, expanding into production the more you've worked in every department the more you can appreciate what's involved and what's required and more critically, it'll also teach you to appreciate people who are really good at that particular discipline. So, you know, e.g., I've, you know, had a few, you know, gigs where I've done follow spots, um, you know, but that, if nothing else, teaches you to appreciate people who are really good at doing that or, you know, a great costume designer or whatever. So <clears throat> that's probably the first bit is try and get a, you know, rounded experience. So, you, you, you know, that helps you integrate into a bigger production. Um, than if you're just a real silo mentality. And the other thing is, um, in terms of the international thing, is really just do what it takes. Um, I, I didn't have any particular um, clever plan other than um, just banging on doors wherever I could get near a door to bang on it. Um, and that, you know, sometimes involved saving up money and uh, getting overseas when I could and, uh, and going around people and, um, and begging them for five minutes of their attention. And, you know, it's, it's not easy. You get a lot of knockbacks and everything, but I think if you're determined to make it happen, you'll find a way. And the way, you know, someone listening to this, the way they find it won't be the way I found it. It'll be unique to you and your set of circumstances. And that's all about keeping your eyes open and wide so you can see opportunities and angles that aren't necessarily sitting right in front of you. They might be over your left shoulder, you know. Of course. Um, I will open up to some questions as well. So if anyone's watching who wants to um, ask a question, I believe you can either hit the raise your hand button at the bottom or hit the Q&A button and chuck something in. So uh, if anyone wants to jump on in there uh, and while we do that, I'll, um, I'll just kind of follow up with a little bit about um, a little bit about your, your earlier experiences uh, when you were growing up here. Um, when we talked the other week, you, you, you talked about um, you 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 move you move around quite a bit. You spend a bit of time in Rotonga as well, um, but you were kind of you you were a Kiwi at heart, even though it was kind of across the country. Mm. Do you have do you have a special place that that 
within New Zealand that you that, that inspires you that you kind of would call home or that you mm. think really kind of that you would go back to if you came back here where would you where would you go back to oh in terms of to where to live um not sure I mean I've you know mostly been a South Islander at heart and I do have a particular soft spot for the west coast where I escape to uh, wherever you know whenever possible which isn't often but I do find it's such a way of getting away from everything just to be you know out there in nature with relatively few people around so um, I mean I was you know traveling over there only a handful of weeks before coming back up here to the UK um, a month ago um, so any, anywhere anywhere I can see mountains I think is is, uh, is, is fairly uh, you know is, is, is a plus um, yeah <laughs> like a lot of people um, you know the, the idea of uh, you know living at least part of the year somewhere like uh, Wanaka or Queenstown is, is attractive but you know that's that comes with a high a high entry price so we'll, we'll, we'll see um, you know all, all, all in New Zealand's pretty amazing to me so um, you know any anywhere is good really I, I, find, I find the country inspiring generally and and the people as well i think you know we forget what a positive can do attitude kiwis have generally and you know whenever i'm home i always enjoy the fact everyone's you know everyone's smiling generally and um helpful and interested and that's not something you guarantee everywhere you go in the world great yeah that's cool so talking about leaving home a little bit um you got to do uh you produced a show the django is that right ninjago the jago yeah. sorry yeah so it seems kind of it, it seemed like an unlikely um when i was when i was reading it, it seemed like a really unlikely uh kind of experience to end up in. can you tell us a little bit more about kind of what what that show was and the uniqueness of it yeah, so so that was um, yeah, a live Lego Ninja show, um, which you know obviously isn't something that comes your way every day. But when I joined the Merlin Entertainment Group in London, the um, company owns resorts and um, parks all over the world. And one of the remits I had when I came on board, the, the um, Merlin owned six or seven at the time and more now um, Legoland parks around the world. But one of their challenges was they'd never figured out a way of doing live Lego based entertainment. They had entertainment on their resorts, but it was stuff you could have seen anywhere, you know, singers, dance parties and whatever. And the, the thing was, how, how do we bring Lego to life? So I probably spent a good two, two and a half years um, in R&D on that um, and figuring out, you know, fundamentally Lego starts with the minifigure and how we could bring that to life. So in the end, uh, it came out with a show that involved uh, slightly over one meter tall um, puppets or uh, Lego themed and uh, a fully projection mapped um, set uh, which wrapped around the audience because I really wanted to create the idea of bricks um, building and being disassembled and reassembled into different scenes. And we're able to do that. We worked with artists in motion from Sydney who did, handled all our projection mapping. And then the rest of it was some um, Bunraku style um, puppetry with the puppet tears in full view, but um, with the nature of the theme and black ninja costumes. So they, they disappeared into the, uh, into the background and we brought these, um, these characters to life. And of all the things I've done over the years, it was one where not only did it land where we were hoping design and reception wise, but it kind of exceeded it. So it was a bit of a cool gig to do because we had an absolutely killer team on it. And we really got the result we we're after, and you know that that was evidenced by winning some awards, and then going on to um, do productions in Dubai and Japan um, after the original production we did in Malaysia. So, you know, so, you... something a bit out of shape. I wouldn't have expected to be doing that, but I wasn't expecting to do the Edinburgh tattoo either. So, you know, it just tells you, you know, <laughs> certainly. And I, th I think like the scene that you you did, well, I mean, one of your first big opportunities internationally was with the Jim Henson Company. Um, and do you think that you, and then to see you do some more puppet work over there, do you have a particular affiliation with, with working with puppets and is that, Yeah, is that I did, it started off as a kid really. Um, 
I and I've told the story many times, but where, when I when I was really young, I you know I was doing the you know the Kiwi boy thing of being in a rugby team and you know getting seven bells knocked out of me every Saturday morning, uh, and at the same time, uh, Hanson's Muppet Show had um, exploded onto the onto the TV screens and was an absolute phenomenon at the time, and I got wildly excited by that at around the same time as I was getting wildly unexcited about um, getting getting. Um, everything knocked out of me on a Saturday morning on the rugby field. So I eventually, uh, when the season finished, I, I took my green rugby sock and um, made it into a Kermit the Frog puppet and, um, and then convinced a few friends at school to join me. And we um, created our own puppet show, which we'd sort of perform on a weekly basis. So, you know, it's all a case of, you know, pivot and, uh, and adapt. <laughs> yeah it's a um it's... so you know they, they, then i was probably 10 or 11 then and you know many years later when i got to um jim henson's creature shop in london you know it sort of sort of completed a long journey in a lot of ways which was pretty cool that's fantastic cool well i think we'll um we'll start to wrap it up i've got a few thank yous to say but i'll, I'll give us a couple of minutes so we can uh uh so people can get across to the next session but um just before we go do you have anything do you get any kind of Last comments or anything else that you that you've been dying to to speak about or get out? No, just just really for anyone who's listening, um, you know, we're com we're coming from a pretty amazing industry in New Zealand with some really talented people, and the, the, there's nothing you can't learn um, within the confines of you know New Zealand in terms of getting started. The international stuff expands, and it's you know it's just often it's a case of more zeros on the budget, but the um, but the dynamics are the same, and the the skills you need are the same. So you know I think it's I, I feel incredibly positive about New Zealand's industry, and I'm not just saying that you know because I'm sitting over here and and what have you. I, I think it's an incredibly um, strong field. You know, there's a lot to be learned, and the and the people it generates are really strong. You know, we see that working all over the world. So. You know, don't be discouraged of anyone who's finding it tough at the moment because it is tough in our field at the moment. But, um, but you know, the opportunities are starting to come back and I'm certainly seeing that. Um, so, you know, I think it will light up and I think, you know, Kiwi, Kiwi practitioners are going to be in a very good position to take advantage of it. Yes, I think, I think it is coming back around and I think we're very fortunate to, um, to have the resilience that we've had. Um, thank you so much for... Um, Staying up late to talk to us. My pleasure. Uh, I know it's a bit, it's, it's not the ideal interview time on the other side of the world, but uh, we do really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'll, just, I'll say thank you so much. To, um, obviously, a huge thanks to NNS and Verlo who are, are looking after getting this conference online. Um, for me, it's easy because I just have to hit Zoom, but they're doing uh, a lot of work in the background to keep all the sessions going today uh, and tomorrow. So thanks heaps for that. Um, a reminder to... Uh, Please uh, attend our AGM uh, this afternoon at 5.30, which is also on one of these links. Uh, you do need to register for that separately, so please remember to do that. Um, up next on the uh, alternate uh, stream channel, uh, or starting in about five minutes, is rigging, for, uh, rigging maths for non-riggers, uh, looking at information around loadings and what other departments need to share with the rigging department of venues. Uh, which is run by Sam Johnson, Steve Sanders, Chris Brown, and Genevieve Pope will be there as well. So uh, that'll be a really good one. Uh, we've got sessions all the way through to 5.30 today and then all of tomorrow. So please make sure you do um, head up a few of those and check them out. Um, and from myself in Auckland, thank you so much. Thank you again, Michael. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk with My you. My pleasure. Loved it. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Matua.